Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Levasseur. So today we are finishing up with the Kathleen and Michael Peterson case. This is our last episode in this this case series. And I kind of left off last week with the suggestion about, you know, something not being so transparent and upfront about Dwayne Deaver. So I kind of will lead into that with this. But before we do start, do you have anything you want to say? No, I'm looking forward to tonight. I, I'm starting to develop an opinion. I wanted to reserve judgment until this last part. And mm-hmm. so I'm holding off on it just in case something changes in my mind. But I, I feel like, I feel pretty confident with what I'm going to say. But yeah, you always sometimes you throw things at me and then I'm like, oh, OK, now now I'm not so confident. So we'll see. I, I think I for, for the most part of the series, like I'm stumbling over my words because I don't know really how to say this. But for the most of, of the series, I've been very unbiased. I tried to be and I really didn't show Michael Peterson's side of things too much. Like I pretty much showed like what the prosecution had, what their evidence was. And yeah, there was times where I was like, oh, that was shady and I didn't like that. But I really like focused from the prosecution's angle for the most part. And this time I'm going to go a little bit behind the curtain or <laughs> behind the staircase, if you will, if yeah. you're Michael Peterson and and kind of talk about from his perspective why the prosecution really did a horrible job and, and why I, you know, I don't blame him for being upset and why if he is an innocent person, which it's it, there's a chance that he is right. This completely destroyed every single like atom and molecule of his life to a point where you you don't really even understand. Like, I mean, he lost his his book going into a movie deal. You know, as soon as he was charged, he went bankrupt because he paid out a civil suit to Caitlin Atwater. Obviously, nobody trusts him. He's not going to have any best selling books because nobody wants to put you know, a suspected murderer on the New York Times bestseller. So it, it really just destroyed his life. And there is a chance he's innocent. And I know there's a lot of people who who believe wholeheartedly that he's guilty. But I still think in those people, there's a sliver inside of them where it's like, yeah, I like instinctually, I feel that he's guilty, but there is a chance he's innocent. And if he is, this sucks, right? Yeah. This really sucks. So I really want everyone to keep that in mind. So we're going to sort of like, Segue here into SBI agent Dwayne Deaver, who was allowed to testify as an expert witness during the Michael Peterson murder trial due to his extensive credentials and previous experience. So you get him up on the stand and you know how the lawyers do it. They're like, well, tell us how you how long you've been in this job and what did you do for school and what training have you had? So he goes over it all in in court, and he said that he had gone to school for zoology. He'd been hired by the Raleigh Crime Lab in 1985, and he had started at the SBI Academy in 1986. And then it was in the fall of 1987 that he began taking classes in bloodstain analysis. Deaver claimed to have been hands-on in over 500 cases involving bloodstain pattern analysis. He said he had personally investigated 15 cases that had involved falls, and he'd written 200 papers on bloodstain analysis, as well as taught courses and gave lectures about bloodstain pattern analysis. At the time that he testified at Michael Peterson's murder trial, Dwayne Deaver claimed he was one of only two people at the SBI with this level of training and experience, and he was actually personally responsible for the education and training of 20 other individuals, which, I mean, is terrifying when you find out what we're about to find out. So Dwayne Deaver, he actually got pretty defensive when his credentials were cross-examined by Michael Peterson's lawyer, David Rudolph. You know, David's like, well, you went to school for zoology. What does animals have to do with humans and stuff like that? And and Dwayne Deaver was like, shut up. Like, I got all my training for bloodstain pattern, like, when I was with the SBI. Mm-hmm. Like, that has nothing to do with anything. But then David Rudolph brought up the fact that one of Dwayne Deaver's instructors had actually kind of been found out that she had exaggerated her credentials and maybe she hadn't been qualified herself to be teaching others this science. And he got like super defensive. He was like, well, I don't know anything about that. But, you know, she was a good teacher. 
So basically what it looks like here is kind of like to go to a legal term that really isn't valid for what I'm about to say, but fruit of the poisonous tree, right? One person teaches bad science. So this instructor teaches bad science to Dwayne Deaver. Dwayne Deaver goes on to teach bad science to 20 other people under him. And then we have a really corrupted sort of um, agency here that they, they think they know about blood pattern analysis and they think that they know what they're doing, but they they maybe necessarily don't exactly know what they're doing. And you have to consider when he went into blood stain pattern analysis in like the, the 80s, 1987, it was such a new cutting edge thing to begin with at this point. You know, to the fact that they were even starting to use it in trials and things like that was pretty new. And so he kind of grew with it. But it isn't – it is more of like an interpretive thing rather than a science. And I think we kind of touched on that last episode that it has to be really perfect and you still might not be able to tell exactly what happened from the blood stain patterns. Yeah, and I think that goes to, unfortunately with a lot of things in, in, in law enforcement where even voice analysis or sometimes they'll bring in – uh, people who are body language experts, even uh, handwriting analysis. It's not mm-hmm. a science. It's not a science. And, and, you know, some people think that it is like, hey, this automatically means no, it's it's subjective in some ways where, yeah, there's some standard protocol, but ultimately it's up to the person who's interpreting that information. And you could have two experts look at it and both see it in different ways. So, I said this before, I'll say it again. Not only do expert witnesses have to be good at what they do, they have to be somewhat of a showman to kind of sell their interpretation to the jury because ultimately they're the ones that are going to decide which expert to believe. They're both giving their opinions. They both can't be right if they're on two different ends of the aisle. So uh, that's kind of what goes into be a good, uh, being a good witness and, and being someone who is successful in those cases. I know um, – if you've watched Breaking Homicide, forensic psychologists, they're very big in, in in trials. And Chris Mohandi, Dr. Chris Mohandi, good friend of mine, he testifies all over the country for these cases. And he'll tell me right out how he'll be on the stand interpreting a, an interview that he conducted with a defendant or or someone who's involved in the trial. And he's like, I'm, I'm, up, I'm up there against someone else who is supposedly an expert and they don't know what the hell they're talking about, but you can tell they're saying what the the team that hired them is, you know, wanting them to say. And it's, he's like, it's discouraging. So yeah, with all of this stuff, not only blood spatter recognition, just in general, we always have to kind of look at it and make your own opinion based on the evidence, because you don't know what the underlying agenda is for some of these experts. So from seeing Deaver on the stand, for me, I think that the jury bought what he was saying because he was so confident. Like, yeah. he bought what he was saying, okay? Like, <laughs> the best liar believes their lies. And in this true. way, the best expert witness believes that what they're saying is 100 million percent true to the point where David Rudolph would be questioning him and Dwayne Deaver would be, like, indignant, almost like, what do you know, you stupid lawyer? I am the scientist. I am the one who's had all this training. What I am telling you is 100% true, and I'm insulted that you're even questioning me about it. There was, I think, three times that I noticed where David Rudolph asked Dwayne Deaver a question, and Dwayne Deaver like, looked off into the distance and didn't even answer him. Like, This isn't even worthy of a response. So I think that cockiness, that confidence almost gave the jury a false sense of confidence. Like this dude clearly knows his shit because he's like insulted when the the criminal defense lawyer is questioning him. And on that note, what does the criminal defense lawyer know? Why is he questioning this, you know, medical professional, this expert bloodstain pattern analysis guy? Like he should be indignant. So it really was this thing where Together, the jury and Dwayne Deaver were almost like David Rudolph shouldn't even be asking questions about this. Clearly, Dwayne Deaver knows what he's talking about. And I really think that's where it came from because, I mean, you see him. He's this bespectacled guy. He takes it very seriously. He talks very, like, monotone. He He's like exactly what you would think of if you looked, thought of an expert witness who's talking about, like, any sort of, like, forensic science. He is what you would picture. And I, I'm glad you said that because – Sometimes when when we frame things, and even just when I was speaking, it's it, I'm presenting it as oh they clearly know they're wrong, and yet they're still saying whatever they think they that people want them to say. No, there's a reality where both experts doing their job to the best of their ability look at the the data, 
and come to two different conclusions. And the reason that they're able to do, like you just said, go on the stand and testify and sound so confident is because even though it doesn't necessarily have to be a lie in their mind, they might actually believe what they're saying, even if it's inaccurate. Um, with, with Deaver, I think it's a little deeper than that. We've gone over, over the four episodes where there's clearly some negligence there at minimum, some negligence, probably more than that, yeah. where there's a clear attempt to just disregard certain things that he saw or heard. That's a problem, obviously, professionally and ethically when it comes to the trial. But in some cases, you could have two experts. We have it happen a lot with uh, former law enforcement experts, self, you know, use of force experts. There's so many uh, police use of force experts out there. And they're all, in most cases, former local police or even federal police. And yeah, they all have different experiences, different backgrounds and different personal interpretations of things. So you have these guys go up there and it's pick your poison, right? If you interview enough use of force experts, you'll probably find one that agrees with whatever narrative you're trying to push. So uh, with blood spatter, I would I would like to think DNA, blood spatter. It's a little bit more of a science, but with use of force, it's based on a lot of the interpretation of the policy. So yeah, it's, it's definitely an issue in, in our judicial system. It's not perfect, but it's, it's definitely better than nothing. Yeah. I think Dwayne Deaver definitely probably believed what oh, he was saying. Yeah. If you're, if you're taught improperly, you don't know any better. Right. And it I could, think bec because of that self-righteousness, the, the evidence that came forward that didn't match that because he thought it was such a perfect science when it didn't match that. He was like, well, I have so much faith in my in my craft and what I'm doing here that this evidence must be an outlier. So I'm just going to like ignore it. You know, it could have been one of those examples where we talk about detectives where they already have come to a conclusion. Now they're just trying to reverse yes. engineer it from that mm -hmm. conclusion. Oh, he he definitely did it. So let's find the, the facts that support that and build in reverse instead of, hey, let's start on this trail of breadcrumbs and see where it leads us. So it could it doesn't it doesn't only apply to detectives. It could happen with uh, experts as well, where they're brought in and they look at the initial report and go, oh, yeah, he definitely murdered her. And now they're going to build that case it can happen with anyone. We're only human. Right. Yeah. Yep. But the, the, the key is to check yourself yeah. <laughs> and be yeah. a professional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So either way, after hearing his credentials, the court decided based on Deaver's testimony that he was experienced enough to be an expert witness in the matter of blood stain analysis for the trial. Uh, but then in 2011, Dwayne Deaver was fired from the SBI after an outside review of the SBI and their crime lab revealed that SBI agents had misrepresented evidence in more than 200 cases. And Deaver himself had given false testimony in 34 cases. Now, the case that triggered this outside review was that of Greg Taylor, who was exonerated in 2010 and is actually considered the first person in the United States history to be declared innocent by a court of law instead of not guilty, as is usually the case. So with Greg Taylor, the way it went was in 1991, the body of 26-year-old Jaquetta Thomas was found stabbed and beaten to death in a rally called the sack. A Nissan Pathfinder that belonged to Greg Taylor was parked nearby, and when he returned to it the next day, he was arrested and charged with murder. Now, he told the police, listen, I had nothing to do with this murder. Me and my friend Johnny Beck, we were just smoking crack cocaine in my vehicle that night, and we parked up a small dirt road off the cul-de-sac, but when we tried to leave, the Pathfinder got stuck in the mud, and they couldn't get it free, so Taylor and Beck left on foot. Now, Greg Taylor said that he and his friend had seen what appeared to be a dead body in the cul-de-sac that night, but they had not informed the police, probably because they were smoking crack, right? And they're like, that's none of my business. I'm smoking crack. And they move on with their life. Although Greg Taylor insisted he had nothing to do with Jaquetta's murder, he was put on trial, a trial during which SBI agent and blood stain analysis expert Dwayne Deaver testified that blood was found inside Taylor's vehicle. Based on that testimony, Greg Taylor was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, where he stayed for 17 years until another man in prison confessed to Jaquetta's murder. A panel was put together to try and figure out how Greg Taylor could have been found guilty with so little evidence, and it was discovered that the one witness, Eva Kelly, who had claimed she'd seen the victim, Jaquetta, get into Taylor's Pathfinder, she ended up admitting, like, yeah, I actually didn't see that, but I made a deal with the prosecution to testify that I did see that. Now, according to Yahoo News, quote, 
Deaver also testified during the hearing and admitted that the SBI had conducted additional tests on Greg Taylor's vehicle, but had not shared those findings with the court. The SBI's DNA test showed that what the prosecution had said was blood in the vehicle wasn't blood at all. Deaver said the SBI did not send the results of the later test to prosecutors or to the defense, so the results didn't appear in Greg Taylor's trial. What's more, he said that holding back such blood tests, those that might exonerate defendants, was official SBI policy. The investigators were withholding evidence in every single case. End quote. That's a problem. Yeah. I don't really know what to say there. It's horrible to think that this person and many others may have been in prison for a crime they didn't commit. Many others. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because for me, if this is being deliberately done, I don't really think that having him lose his job is enough. I agree. Should be criminally prosecuted for this, as well as anybody else that can be tied to not having direct knowledge of this type of behavior. And if you can go in there, have an outside review uh, from some federal agents, whatever it might be, to kind of put the dots together and get these guys rolling on each other to find out who is, in fact, doing this, uh, they should all be charged criminally. Uh, And it should be hefty because what it will do is deter people from doing it in the future. It's one thing just to hope that people are truthful and ethical. It's another thing to hold them accountable. It's kind of for those. This isn't a plug, but we were just talking about this on Crime Weekly News, which you should have already seen by now. It's absolutely a plug. Well, it's okay that it's a plug. It's a Go plug. watch Crime Weekly News. Yeah. It's a plug. <laughs> it's a plug. And we're talking <laughs> about how we're, we're discussing Alec Baldwin and how regardless of what happens in this, it's going to change policy on these movie sets. Well, this is a similar thing where if you have if you find that an expert witness or an agency is doing something like this, that's resulting in innocent people going to prison for crimes they didn't commit. There should be individuals going to prison and not 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 for six months. Uh, it should be hefty. It should be severe um, to deter people from doing it in the future. So, yeah, I don't think him being fired is enough. It's just it's incredible that this that they would do something like this. But I'm sure they're not the only uh, individuals who are doing something like this because we do find other people who have gone to prison for crimes they didn't commit. And the only way to change that trajectory is to start holding people accountable other than just firing them. Yeah, I agree. And um, I, they always say like prison isn't a deterrent. And that may be the case in like murderers and stuff like that. But like, but I feel like prison is a deterrent for me. You know, like I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm know. not going to commit like tax fraud because I don't want to go to prison because I know that people do go to prison when they commit tax yeah. fraud. You see Teresa Judice and you're like, man, they're going after <laughs> Teresa Judice from no Housewives. one's safe. No one's safe. <laughs> they're going after her. Yeah, But it's like it's a deterrent, I think, for some of these like, you know, lesser things like and I don't mean lesser like they're not bad, but lesser than murder. Like maybe. Yeah, maybe it's not a deterrent for murderers because a lot of murders happen as like a crime of passion thing or because they have a motive and they're hoping they get away. But like lesser things, it's definitely a deterrent. And if these people start and I always think like like judges have judicial immunity and I don't think that they really should, because then I think that they're going to take it more seriously when they let out a violent criminal oh, on yeah. bail. I have you spoken know? about that publicly. They qualify. They, they they can't be charged for anything. They can't be held they accountable can't. for anything they do. There's no accountability. So why would they even care? But people people get let out of prison and then let out on bail and then they go and reoffend and, and other people are dead. And who's responsible for that? You had a violent offender in your hands and you said, go on, run forward and prosper. Then then someone needs to answer for that, right? And I think if judges had to, they would take these decisions a little bit more seriously. I know it couldn't work like this because there's got to be standards and all these things. But in a perfect world, if they could prove definitively, it goes to trial and you put someone like Deaver on the stand where it's, it's, it's found out through testimony from jury members, whatever, that his testimony, you know, him stating that blood from the victim was found in this individual's vehicle was the the deciding factor. Why shouldn't he do 18 years in prison? Mm -hmm. Eye for an eye. Really simple. (laughs) We don't have to think about it. It's not murder, like you said, but I would say losing 18 years of your life is pretty close to death when you're in there because you can't do anything. So I think the only fair thing is if you can pin it down to one specific thing, or even if it's multiple people in their their testimony or what they said when they knew that that information was false, or even if they later learned it, if you are able to rule that person out that was found guilty, 
why wouldn't the people responsible for putting these innocent people in prison be held to the same standard and get 17, 18 years just like the person who was uh, unjustly uh, found guilty of a, tr- a crime they didn't commit? I think that's fair. It makes it simple, right? Yeah, I mean, it would never work because then nobody would yeah. take that job. <laughs> yeah, no, it would never work. But that, see, that's no. the sad thing, right? Like, I'm okay with expert witnesses who come forward and give a, a, a an assessment and they might be wrong because that happens. They're human. Like you said, like you, you could, you could look at it and truly believe based on your training that that's what it is and it not be. I'm saying when you have something like this, where it comes out that there was information where they, they had already known it wasn't blood in that vehicle, but yet that information was just not relayed to anyone. He said, we never, we always keep, we always withhold this information. Well, so he and everybody else who's we should be held accountable criminally then because that's a terrible policy hey if we find evidence that ultimately that's exculpatory and could free an innocent man our policy is not to release that information and just let that person sit there forever what there has to be some stakes yeah something at stake for 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 people involved in these i agree at minimum there has to be accountability for those individuals and i think we will it's not going to be perfect, but we can clean it up a little bit. Yeah, I think Dwayne Deaver got his job back, too. Like, I think he sued and like got a lawyer and he got his job back. So Jesus. there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was also found that Dwayne Deaver had greatly exaggerated his actual experience. And the things that Deaver did in these cases where he got in trouble for, like, he did that in Michael Peterson's case. He would refer to stains as blood when they hadn't been confirmed to be blood. So, you know, all the time you hear these experts in court say like dark stains or blood like stains, but they don't know because they haven't tested them chemically to make sure that they are blood. So they can't say these are blood stains. Deaver had no such hangups. He was like, that's a blood stain. Absolutely. It's a blood stain, even though they hadn't been confirmed to be blood. And his experiments failed to follow basic scientific methods. So essentially, he worked backwards from a theory, the prosecution's theory. And that theory was that Kathleen Peterson had been beaten to death with a blowpoke. So Deaver conducted his experiments that weren't scientific to begin with, such as like hitting a bloody sponge over and over again. And he would replicate those experiments until he got the blood spatter pattern that he wanted. So it wasn't like, let me do this this experiment so I can show you what type of blood spatter pattern this experiment makes. It was like, let me do this experiment until I get the exact right angle where the blood spatter pattern that we see at the scene is going to be replicated. And it was just like very clear what he was doing. And you could even hear him like in some of these videos because they showed videos of the experiments of the jury. And after doing it like several times, finally he like got it right. I think it was like the eighth or ninth time. And he was like, yeah. And he like high-fived the other guy. And I was like, what? Like they just scored a goal or like their team just made it to the Super Bowl. And it was like, this is awkward. It's like we won. You know, we were able to replicate this blood stain pattern after multiple attempts. That's not good science. It's the opposite of good science. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't I don't like the uh, you could tell that there's a personal investment there, which would obviously cloud judgment. So. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't like it either. So I want to tell you more about all the bad things Dwayne Deaver did, but let's take a quick break first and we'll be right back. Size matters, but as they say, it's not just the size of the boat, it's the motion of the ocean. With my base weekender bag, there's room for everything. With hyper-functional and chic designs, you've got all the nooks and crannies and even some surprise space to effortlessly fit it all in so you don't have to settle for anything less. Listen, legitimately, base is great. I love everything they have. The Weekender's awesome. I love their rolling luggage. Their makeup bag is my favorite makeup bag. It's the easiest thing to clean. If your makeup breaks in it, you can just clean it out easily. And their hanging duffel bag is a literal game changer. I'm not messing with you. Everything that they have is really amazing. I wish I could buy it all. And Base was actually created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has thought of everything you could ever want in a piece of luggage, 360-degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, 
built-in weight indicator. The way it works is if it's red, it's over 50 pounds. If it's not, it's under and you're good to go. They also have washable bags for your dirty clothes in all the interior pockets you need to keep organized. And their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors. And for shorter trips, the Weekender bag is super functional. It even has like a place at the bottom to store your shoes separately. So, you know, you have dirt and stuff on the bottom of your shoes. You don't want to put them in with your clothes. So you just put in that little separate pouch underneath. Every piece is made to look better with miles, so you don't have to worry about it in cargo or overhead. And base has over 30,000 five-star reviews. So whether you're looking for a quick trip or you're looking to breeze through the security line, base has your personal items covered. I legitimately love, I love their luggage. I love their bags. I love everything about them. You guys should try base out for yourself. Derek's going to tell you how. Yeah, my mom and my sister just actually went on a trip and my, my mom didn't have any luggage, so I let her use the base travel luggage and simply put, I'm not getting it back. And my sister was like, well, I want some now, get it from me. And I was like, hey, you might want to listen to next week's episode because we got a good code for you. So right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash crime weekly. Just go to basetravel.com slash crime weekly for 15% off your first purchase. That's B E I S travel dot com slash crime weekly okay we're back still talking about Dwayne Deaver so additionally Deaver said the blood stains on Michael Peterson's shorts showed that he had beaten Kathleen to death we talked about that but during the trial when he was asked if there'd been any blood found on the navy blue shirt that Michael had been wearing that night Deaver said He didn't know. He said the material of the shirt was too dark to see blood, so he didn't use it as evidence. David Rudolph said to Deaver, like, listen, did you know you could have done a Lumalite test to show blood on the dark material? And Deaver said, yeah, actually, I believe a Lumalite test was done on the shirt. And to his knowledge, it had not turned up any blood, which is huge because you'd expect to see blood on Michael Peterson's shirt if he was violently beating his wife to death, you know, one. And two, the prosecution had not delivered the results of this Lumalite test to the defense. David Rudolph asked Deaver, like, are you sure that this Lumalite test was done? And Deaver was like, yeah. And David Rudolph was like, well, did you write a report on this Lumalite test? And Deaver was like, yes. And he was like, did you give it to the prosecution? And Deaver was like, yes. And it's so funny in the staircase documentary, you can see when Deaver says this, they like pan over to Frida Black, one of the prosecutors, and she's looking at Deaver like this. <laughs> I know you can't see me on audio, but she's like, like her eyes get so wide and she I don't know what the look is because honestly I don't know I could not tell you if Deaver is lying about writing the report or if if she's and that's why she's looking at him like that like what the hell are you talking about you didn't give us a report or if she's like shut up Deaver shut up don't talk about the Lumalite test either way apparently a Lumalite test was done which showed no blood on Michael Peterson's shirt and um you know, there's there's no report to be found in the prosecution's notes. They didn't turn anything over to the defense. So either Deaver purposely withheld information, as remember, in 2011, he said the SBI does that. They do that. And anytime there's evidence that, you know, exonerates the, uh, the defendant, they'll just hold it back. That's pretty commonplace. Either he did that and didn't give it to the prosecution or he did give it to the prosecution and the prosecution was like, nah, we're not going to pass this along to the defense. Well, I mean, think about it. It's one of those things where what we were saying earlier, where this evidence could could help Michael Peterson. Exculpatory. Yeah, it's exculpatory. So it doesn't help what he's trying to do. Right. Which is prove that Michael Peterson killed his wife. So you may forget to write that in your report, may forget to update that one where it's like, oh, you know what? There's nothing on the blood, but we can explain that away. It's possible he the angle in which her head was, you know, being struck, that it would go this way, that it's perfectly reasonable. And that's how they justify it. And I think that's a big deal because, yeah. you know, even if you're hitting her with a blow poke, which we already have decided, I think that's that's not possible. Yeah. Um, and there was multiple instances where Dwayne Deaver was doing these experiments with the blow poke and the blow poke was breaking because it's a thin, hollow tube made out of like a very lightweight sort of material. I don't know what it is. It's like a metal, but it's light and it's hollow. So yeah, like if you hit it hard, it's going to break. The blow poke was constantly breaking in this dude's experiments. And yet he failed to think that that was relevant, that like the blow poke could have broken while Michael Peterson was hitting 
Kathleen with it. So whether you look at it as, oh, he used a blow poke, which we don't think he did, no. or he was beating her head against the stairs, which is kind of like my theory. If it happened, that's what happened. Either way, if you're beating her head against the stairs, you've got to be down close enough to her, like bent over her where you can, you know, in arm's reach. You're going to get blood on your shirt. You're going to get blood on your shirt. But there was no blood on his shirt. So some people have said like, oh, well, he must have changed his shirt before first responders got there. Well, then where's the other shirt? You know, where's the other shirt? Because the first responders got there. The police came. They locked it down. They collected evidence, I'm sure. And they went into all the bedrooms. They looked through that. They looked through hampers and stuff. They would have found a shirt with blood on it. Where did the shirt with blood on it go? Who were the people that were there early in the night and saw Exactly. Him? Todd and Christina so were like, was... yeah, that was the shirt he was wearing earlier, too. So, yeah. <laughs> Unless he, like, changed. If it was, like, really premeditated, like he pulled an American Psycho where he, like, put the, the plastic, like, uh, what do you call those things? Ponchos? Like he put that yeah. over. Yeah. I mean, yeah. now we're like talking. Like a Tyvek suit sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. No. Or he like had two navy blue shirts. Okay. Yeah. Or he was like, I'll wear this when everyone's here and then I'll take it off, kill her and put it back on. Yeah. But like, come on, man. We already have decided we don't see how this could possibly be that premeditated because it was a mess yeah. of a scene. So additionally, in Michael Peterson's case, there were multiple instances of changes happening between photos being taken. So for instance, in one photo of the kitchen area, there was a drop of blood that was not seen in another photo of the same area that was taken on the same day. And when asked about these changes, SBI agent Dan George told David Rudolph that he'd been informed that spot was just a photo glitch and not actually a drop of blood. And Rudolph asked George if he'd informed the prosecution or Dwayne Deaver of the fact that this mark was not blood, but a photo glitch. And George said he didn't believe he'd informed anybody about that fact. And, you know, the whole time they were using this glitch as a drop of blood in their analysis. There's also photos of the staircase that showed what they call skeletonized blood stains. Basically, it's a blood stain pattern that can happen if uh, blood's allowed to partially dry before it's wiped up. So since the blood tends to be thinner at the edge of the drops, this edge portion dries first, leaving liquid in the middle. So it looks like kind of skeletonized. But some of those blood stain patterns showed normally in one picture and then skeletonized in the next. And this was after the scene had been sealed off and Michael Peterson had been removed from the home. So clearly it hadn't been Michael who'd been wiping the drying blood. It had happened when the crime scene techs had started processing the scene. And you might say like, oh, who cares? You know, like Michael Peterson already admitted to wiping up blood. Yeah, he admitted to wiping up some blood. But the whole fact of the matter is like you have to keep the integrity of the crime scene. Like when you take pictures that are then going to be used for a blood stain analysis, which is going to decide whether somebody spends the rest of their life in prison, you better make sure that scene wasn't altered from the moment you saw it. Like, that's it. And it was altered, you know, in multiple instances. Additionally, the footprints that were allegedly in blood walking all over the place, suggesting that Michael Peterson had staged the scene after Kathleen's death, those footprints had been supposedly cleaned up, but there were no wipe marks, and the mop in the house tested negative for blood, and there was no evidence that the footprints have ever existed because no photos had been taken of them after the luminol had been placed. So basically, it's just in somebody's notes where they're like, oh, yeah, there's footprints all over the place. But like it does to me, it doesn't make sense how you can say there's footprints in luminol, but not say that the footprints looked as if they'd been cleaned up. You know, like you can either see them with the naked eye and you can see that they're there or they've been cleaned up and you can see them with luminol, you know. I know what you're saying. Maybe the wording they used, because yeah, you can have something where to the human eye, you can't see anything, but then obviously when you spray luminol and you apply the, uh, the light, you have this, this clear pattern of wherever the blood was before it was cleaned. So I get what you're saying. There. It probably was a misuse of words because yeah, no, you would see the luminol and, and, it, and that, and even if that were the case, because it's in luminol, you would absolutely take photos of that because there's no yeah. way to replicate that later, obviously. So you would want to have he photo drew a, evidence. He drew a picture. He drew a picture of no, them. No, 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 no. You need, you oh, need photo did. evidence. Yeah, he drew he drew a picture of them. Yeah, you'd want placards out there. You'd want to take photo evidence. You'd want to have scales present because- That's a not pretty a, big thing, you think, like footprints yeah. that are suggesting somebody staged the scene. Why are you not taking photos of it when you're taking photos of every other damn thing in there? Why not that? Well, because also it would show like it would give the jury and everybody else kind of an indication of not only the amount of blood that was present, but also 
depending on how much was seen by the, when it luminol enhanced the blood, you might be able to see a general uh, size of the shoe print where you could put a scale next to it, compare that to Michael Peterson's shoe print to mm-hmm. see if it may be, could it have been Kathleen who walked around for a couple seconds before she fell or what? I don't know. I'm just throwing random things out there. But or like an intruder, right? Because or an the intruder main, theory or the something like that. The main reason the prosecution said it couldn't have been an intruder because they were like, oh, there would have been bloody footprints like fleeing the scene. Yeah. Well, you're saying there were. Yeah, I would definitely expect to see anytime there's a footprint or a tire tread mark or anything that's on the ground that you're going to eventually have to remove. You absolutely do. Agree. We are always trained to do a, a drawing and it's a rough sketch. It doesn't have to be to scale. The, the The main detective will go in there and they'll be responsible for sketching everything out on like a, a sketch pad so that it, you can kind of have an idea of where everything was before it was moved. You're also supposed to take a video of the entire crime scene before touching anything. Every space, one person goes through, takes video evidence of every single nook and cranny. You usually shut off the audio and you just film so that you can put anyone who wants to go back there back in that moment before the scene was processed. Then after you do video, you'll go around and you'll have placards out and you'll take video uh, photos of everything with scales and any type of marking that may indicate size. If you don't have a scale, then at that point you can start collecting things for evidence. But all of that, it's kind of like this redundancy to make sure no matter what comes at you during trial, you can, you can show that to the jury. So they understand what law enforcement and what first responders were seeing when they were there. Exactly. And that wasn't done. So it's like, you can't even really use it because for all we know, you could just made that up. That's the point. Like, yeah, it's a problem. I'm not saying you made it up, but you could have. A sketch pad isn't enough. Oh yeah. There was a footprint here. Okay. But how, how do we know that? How do we know what you saw? Couldn't have been looked at today and been ruled out as a bloody footprint. And maybe there's times where with luminol testing, especially cleaning agents can can enhance a luminol reaction. So exactly. what you can have is, especially on a floor, if they're using some type of cleaning solution to clean their floors, you may get a reaction from luminol that could potentially look like something that it's not. So that's another you can have a false positive. And that's why you really want to document what you see on with your eye on camera so that down the road, if it's ever in question, other experts can come in and take a look at it as well. I think that, you know, with the fact that we know the SBI plays all loosey goosey with like important evidence, um, I'm not going to put it past them that they just maybe thought they saw footprints or thought what they so thought looked like footprints or whatever. But I don't even know if those footprints were, were ever there. But like I said, this revelation triggered a massive audit of the SBI. And once again, it was found that the SBI had misrepresented evidence in more than 200 criminal cases between 1987 and 2003. And Dwayne Deaver himself had personally been involved with 34 of them. And this also triggered many cases to be re-looked at, including Michael Peterson's. But I also want to talk about uh, Mike Nifong, the assistant DA at the time of Michael going to trial, because he's a sketchy guy too. So on March 13th, 2006, Crystal Magnum, who was a North Carolina Central student who worked as a part-time stripper, attended a party at an off-campus house where captains of the Duke lacrosse team lived. She was there for work, and later she claimed she'd been forced into a bathroom and raped. Three members of the lacrosse team were arrested and charged with first-degree forcible rape, first-degree sexual offense, and kidnapping. And later that year, due to inconsistencies in the stories of Crystal and another woman who was with her, the rape charges were dropped by the then district attorney, Mike Nifong. But the other charges stood. Now, Mike Nifong would be disbarred in 2007 after he himself was found guilty of multiple ethics violations for his handling of that investigation. He was found guilty of fraud, dishonesty, making false statements of material fact before a judge, and lying about withholding exculpatory evidence, specifically DNA evidence. In 2016, a man named Daryl Howard, who'd been convicted of murdering two people in 1991, was exonerated by DNA. Uh, Durham police detective Daryl Dowdy was accused of fabricating evidence, and it was discovered that once again, in that case, Mike Nifong withheld evidence from the defense. Once again, this is a problem. So now what I'm what I'm seeing is I can't trust the Durham DA. I can't trust the Durham police and I cannot trust the SBI because they've all been found guilty on multiple occasions 
of doing shady shit that put innocent people or potentially innocent people behind bars. So like (laughs) when Michael Peterson was writing all of those articles, like saying that Durham was corrupt, like was he that far off? Because it looks like Durham's corrupt and I don't want to be arrested there. Like I'll tell you that much. I'm not like if you asked me, where's the one place you don't want to be, you know, arrested? I'd be like abroad because ain't nobody trying to get locked up abroad in Durham, North Carolina. Do not <laughs> do not like arrest me there. So we're not going to visit Durham, North Carolina anytime soon. No, Especially man. Especially now after this episode comes out, they, they're Yo, looking they'll for They'll find you. something. They'll find some trumped looking up charges to put me in. Stephanie Harlow, famous YouTuber arrested for three kilos of cocaine found in her <laughs> truck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would not literally put it past them. So this like, is Derek. They got me. They finally got me. <laughs> I was just driving through. <laughs> <laughs> driving through, and he said, "Oh, Stephanie Harlow." It's like as soon as my car like drives over the border of Durham, North Carolina, they get like a ding, ding, yep. ding, ding in mm-hmm. the police station, and they're like, "We're on it, boys. She's mm-hmm. here. We're finally gonna get her." Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if that's how they. T- it's North Carolina, but it's not like the Deep South. No. Sorry. Oh yeah, I'm sure some people in North Carolina speak like that. Don't be too mad at me. (laughs) I can't can't wait to see the comments now. Oh well, yo, Jim Harden kind of talked. The DA win in Michael Peterson's um, trial, he kind of talked like that. He was like a good old Southern boy. Yeah, you know, it depends. It all depends on your upbringing. Because even me, like I had a pretty strong Rhode Island accent, and I just lost it. It depends on you. Lost it, or you made yourself lose it? I I don't. I didn't intentionally do it, but yeah, I lost it. I think it's just being on television and stuff, and having to pronounce your words because they don't really like when you sound like they can't understand what you're saying. So I feel like I was articulating what I was saying more, and it just slowly went away. I guess I don't know. That Rhode Island boy comes out sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So before we move on away from the people and agencies involved in the Peterson trial who've been caught in bad and unprofessional behavior, let's talk about the medical examiner's office because I'm going scorched earth here today. You really are. In the Winston, <laughs> I'm like over it, honestly, because Stephanie was also a researcher for Michael Peterson's defense team. You just didn't know it. Uh, Should have been. She was a, a a private contractor, and so she's dropping she's dropping ether tonight. I'm just like I am so disgusted, honestly, because. He could be guilty, but we'll never know because they screwed this up. So in the Winston-Salem Journal from a May 2014 article titled Problems Found with North Carolina Medical Examiner Findings, quote, Across North Carolina, medical examiners fail to follow crucial investigative steps, raising questions about the accuracy of thousands of death rulings. The living face the consequences. Widows can be cheated out of insurance money. Families may never learn why their loved ones died. Killers can go free. Because of a medical examiner's mistake, Cherokee County resident Kathy Wilson had her husband's body dug up to show that he was killed by a car accident rather than a heart attack. Shannon Santamore had to fight for three days in court to prove that her husband did not commit suicide. After a medical examiner concluded that David Worley died in a Hartnett County car wreck last July, a funeral home discovered what the medical examiner missed, four stab wounds in his back. So the medical examiner said this dude died from a car accident and apparently didn't look at the body at all because the guy had four stab wounds in his back. Continuing on with the article, his widow is now charged with killing him. The observer's investigation, entailing the most comprehensive analysis of state death rulings ever conducted, found that examiners regularly close cases without following recommended practices. Medical examiners failed to examine bodies in one of every nine cases despite state rules that require them to view every corpse. Nine times out of ten, medical examiners don't visit death scenes, a step that national investigators say is key to investigations. Medical examiners are called in to investigate when the stakes are highest. Suspicious, violent, accidental, and unattended deaths. Those account for about 10,000 of the roughly 75,000 deaths in North Carolina each year. But the state doesn't require examiners to get training and rarely disciplines them when they break the rules. Dr. Deborah Reddish... Where do we know that name from? The state's chief medical examiner, looks like she got promoted, acknowledged the shortcoming in death investigations and blamed them on a lack of money. We're trying to do the best we can with what we have, she said. Last year, the state's failings and sloppy paperwork proved deadly. After an elderly couple died in the same night in a Boone hotel room, the local medical examiner did not go to the scene. He also didn't alert the state toxicology lab in Raleigh about the mysterious circumstances or ask the test to be rushed. It took the state nearly six weeks to determine that carbon monoxide killed the couple. Even then, no one warned the public. 
The next weekend, the poisonous gas leaked into the hotel room again and killed 11-year-old Jeffrey Williams. End quote. Imagine you're the parent of Jeffrey Williams and you knew that these two old people had died from carbon monoxide poisoning and how easy, how easy it would be to figure that out. And yet they just didn't do it because, I don't know, lack of funding? Is that really the answer we're going with? Okay, they just didn't do it. And now your son's dead because somebody didn't do their job. Can you imagine that (laughs) this guy dies with four stab wounds in his back and they say he died from a car accident? Because they clearly didn't even look at, like, how as a medical examiner do you miss four stab wounds in somebody's back? The the lady who killed that dude was probably like, I don't understand how I got away with this, but shit. (laughs) The medical examiner's office in North Carolina is pretty bad, so maybe I have a chance. I guess the moral of the story is uh, if the testimony of Dwayne Deaver and the blood stain analysis convinced you of Michael Peterson's guilt, you're probably basing your decision off of incredibly faulty science. And when someone looks like the good guy, for instance, D.A., Mike and Nifong, they're still capable of doing bad things. And when someone seems like they know what they're talking about or they have an aura of being an expert in the field, things may not always be what they seem. So like use critical thinking all the time and don't just believe what they say because they look like they're on the right team or because they look like they think they know what they're talking about. Let's take a quick break and then I want you to tell me what you think about all of this. Let me know if this is you. Maybe you've been stewing about a health problem you have and you almost resort to texting your friends in a group chat to get their opinion. And I mean, it's obviously extremely unlikely that you're going to find quality medical advice in that group chat, but a place you can find quality medical advice is from a doctor on ZocDoc. There are thousands of medical professionals on ZocDoc who are there to help you. They listen like a friend and they give you the expert care that you need. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed. They take your insurance, they're available when you need them, and they treat almost every condition on under the sun. No more doctor roulette or scouring the internet for questionable reviews. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor that you haven't even met yet. And millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who is patient-reviewed and who fits their needs and schedule just right. With ZocDoc, there's no alarms, no surprises, no issues. Derek's going to tell you how you can get started and check out ZocDoc for yourself. That's right. Go to ZocDoc.com slash Crime Weekly and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Crime Weekly. One more time, ZocDoc.com slash Crime Weekly. All right, so we're back. I'll weigh in quick because you you really laid it out where there's really not much to dispute. The only thing I can say is what are those people thinking when these things are happening? You talk about the stab wounds. Is it just straight negligence where they're just ineptness and they don't know how to do their job? Is it something more where they're they're seeing it and deliberately deciding not to document it? I don't know. I don't know. But either way, it's not a good thing. It shouldn't happen in any situation. So it's unacceptable, period. Uh, but there there are cases where, you know that old saying, like, even if, you know, you know what they call someone who graduates from with a C and that goes to medical school? Doctor. You know, they still get the same degree. Right. Not, not everyone uh, is created equal. Detectives, police officers, lawyers, doctors, you know, even if they're a doctor, it doesn't mean they're a good doctor. Right. They might have barely skated by. They not they might not be very good at what they do or they could have been good at what they do at some point And just over the years, whatever happened, happened and they're just not anymore. So a lot of reasons as to the why. But regardless of what the why might be, it's still unacceptable and shouldn't happen. So it really, at the end of the day, doesn't matter. We were a results based society where we're going to judge you on your work. And this is just shoddy work and it shouldn't happen because people's lives are at stake. I mean, honestly, I just think it's like most likely negligence. Like we don't have time, too much going on. And she kind of said it, right? Funding, you know, so they're rushing through them. They're trying to get them. They're putting it on not having the manpower to complete the the the, the autopsies the, the right way, which is not an excuse. So it's it's it's, uh, it's not. But I'm with you, you know, so it's one of those things where the why really doesn't matter. But that's the only thing I can say about it because the facts are the facts. 
and they're not they don't look good. And honestly, I just don't feel comfortable looking at any case that was tried with all of these clowns involved and being like, absolutely. I know they sucked and made mistakes in every other case, but this one, they were probably just completely above board. Like we've already figured out that they weren't. So I can't take anything that happened in this trial and and use it as, you know, fact. And that's concerning. Like that's that's difficult. But in 2011, Michael Peterson was released from prison on bail pending a retrial after the blood spatter evidence used against him was ruled as being inadmissible. And then in 2017, he accepted an Alford plea rather than go to trial again. But through it all, he has maintained his innocence, saying, quote, accepting this Alford plea has been the hardest thing I've ever done, end quote. Judge Orlando Hudson, who had both presided over the original trial and made the decision in 2011 that Michael Peterson should get a new trial, he said, quote, I think over time, the introduction of the death in Germany was very prejudicial to the defendant. I thought that all the homosexual evidence, however it was used, would have been unduly Truly prejudicial to the defense and probably shouldn't have come into evidence. And I believe ultimately a fair and reasonable juror could make a different decision than was made by the first jury. End quote. Dude, wasn't he the one that was like, yeah, you can have this in? Like, wasn't he the one who made the decision to allow the the bisexual like evidence to come in? That's funny. Maybe he regrets that now. Hindsight's 2020. So let's talk about now what everyone's waited for, the owl theory, the owl theory, which was first proposed by lawyer and Peterson neighbor Larry Pollard. For nearly two decades, Pollard has talked about his theory that a barred owl is responsible for the death of Kathleen Peterson. Now, Larry Pollard is not only a lawyer, but a lifelong hunter who claims to have a lot of knowledge about animal tracks and bleeding patterns from hunting. And when he first saw Kathleen's autopsy photos, he noticed that the wounds in the back of her head looked like scratches, but not scratches from a human, scratches from talons. Pollard believes that Kathleen was attacked by the barred owl outside her home sometime after midnight on December 9th, 2001. She'd left Michael Peterson at the pool and started to go inside when she made a detour to the front yard to place some reindeer statue decorations. Pollard believes that an owl may have imprinted on the reindeer lawn ornaments because he said that there's barred owls living in the barn on the Peterson property, and that's where the reindeer um, lawn ornaments and the Christmas decorations were usually stored until Christmas time. And so I guess like the owl got like an idea that that he was real close to this reindeer statue and so felt threatened when Kathleen grabbed it. Um, imprinting is a form of learning in which an animal gains its sense of species identification. Basically, like, I know I'm an owl because I see other owls around me. Birds, like owls, don't know what they are immediately after they hatch. They need to visually imprint on their parents during a critical period of development, and after imprinting, they will identify as that species for life. Uh, Imprinting for wild birds is crucial to their immediate and long-term survival. So, Listen, I don't know how much I believe in this imprinting theory of Larry Pollard's because that that would mean that you're telling me that for its life, this one barred owl thought it was a wooden reindeer. And I just I just don't believe that. But um, what I do think is possible is that while she if if this is what happened while she was in the barn rifling around and grabbing them, she may have disturbed the owls Um, or maybe there were owls outside in the trees that she disturbed. Pollard believes that Kathleen removed the reindeer from the barn that night and started placing them in her yard, at which point she was attacked by the large bird. She wrestled with the owl and managed to pull it from her head. She then ran inside to safety using the front door because head wounds are bleeding so much. And so rapidly as she ran up the stairs, she slipped on her own blood, not only from the stairs being slippery, but because she was wearing those plastic clear flip flops and because She had alcohol as well as anti-anxiety medication and muscle relaxers in her system. So she's running up the stairs, she slips and falls down the stairs. According to Larry Pollard, Kathleen slipped and fell three times. The third time she slipped, he believes that she hit her head into the molding at the bottom of the staircase, which may have rendered her unconscious. And there she lay in a pool of her own blood until her husband discovered her. Now, the evidence to support this theory is actually pretty plentiful, considering how bizarre it sounds at first. 
First, the autopsy showed that Kathleen Peterson had strands of her own hair in her hands, and a later SBI report noted that she also had a microscopic feather intermingled with her hair in her hands. Larry Pollard says that owls are the only species of bird in the entire world that have these microscopic feathers, and Kate Davis, executive director of Raptors of the Rockies, a Montana-based nonprofit, is also convinced that Kathleen was attacked by an owl, saying that their feet are covered with these microscopic feathers. Davis was being interviewed for a story about an owl attacking a boy who was sledding when she was asked to examine the evidence in Kathleen Peterson's case, and we're going to talk about some of her opinions throughout this theory because she does pop up. Kathleen also had pine needles on her hand, if you remember from the autopsy, and there was a twig found in the dried blood on her body. Actually, the twig was found on, on her head. The pine needles and twig could have been attached to the owl when it swooped from its tree and attacked. Second, barred owls are common in Durham, North Carolina, and there have been multiple records of barred owl attacks on humans. It's been proven that barred owls were living in the woods surrounding the Peterson home. According to multiple experts, barred owls are aggressive and highly territorial. They traditionally nest in the cavities of trees, but because of the intense deforestation, confrontations between barred owls and humans are more common since these forests that allow the birds to remain secluded are shrinking very fast. Wildlife biologist Jonathan Slate says, quote, the more you reduce the places where an owl can nest, the more likely it's going to be nesting somewhere in close proximity to humans. If they're kind of amped up and a fox walks by, a deer walks by, a human walks by, whatever, they'll pop down and try to chase it off, end quote. A woman named Kristen Matheson was attacked by a barred owl in Washington, and she said the attack was fast and silent, but violent. She said, quote, it felt like getting punched in the back of the head by someone wearing rings, end quote. And when she got home, she discovered that her scalp was cut and bloodied. But that same barred owl attacked Kristen again, and this time it left behind five or six deeper cuts that were far more bloody. Additionally, the barred owl is monogamous and strongly territorial, especially during the breeding season, which begins in the late winter in North Carolina, which would have been right around the time that Kathleen Peterson died. Third, neither the defense nor the prosecution could explain the lacerations on Kathleen's scalp, which seemed too deep for an accidental fall, but not deep enough for a violent beating. The trident-shaped lacerations on Kathleen's head does match the talons of a barred owl, however, and they can attack with the same amount of force that would create a blunt force injury like the ones Kathleen had. A 2014 study published in the Journal of Experimental Biology notes that an owl weighing less than one pound can pounce on a mouse with force equivalent to 150 times the weight of the rodent. If a 175-pound human being were struck with that same force and intensity, it would feel as if they were being hit by a 13-ton truck. And barred owls are a larger owl species with the smallest of them weighing one pound, and they can grow as large as two and a half pounds. The barred owl can also fly at speeds of up to 40 miles per hour. Additionally, they are known to dive bomb humans. For instance, in 2015, there were repeated barred owl attacks on joggers in Salem, Oregon, and the victims of these attacks had the owls swoop down at their heads, and they suffered from multiple half-inch talon cuts on their scalps. At least two of the wounds on Kathleen's scalp were in the shape of owl talons. And it's funny because those owls in Salem, Oregon, they called him Owl Capone. <laughs> owl Capone because they just kept attacking these joggers. And they said they thought that when the joggers were running, like their hair bouncing looked like like their prey. You know, they didn't know they were humans. Owls won't attack humans. They usually make mistakes. They either feel threatened or they make a mistake and think you're like, an animal of prey. Like I said, I don't know if I said it in the last episode. I feel like I did. I will scare the shit out of me, man. They do not mess around. They are, they're murderers, okay? Like, not of humans usually, but they, they are really, like, savage with their prey. Fourth, the additional wounds on Kathleen's face and body are consistent with an owl attack. In an interview with a Raleigh news station, Larry Pollard said, quote, the other wounds that are on her body seem to give a compelling case to this having been done by an owl. The injuries to the eyes and the injuries to the elbows and the little pock marks on her wrists. Here and here, all are consistent with her having her hands over her head, holding onto her hair, 
because something is grasping her hair, end quote. Additionally, uh, experts, owl experts, claim that the tiny wounds on Kathleen's face are consistent with the tip of an owl's beak, pecking. Fifth, the blood outside and inside the house may support the owl theory. According to police photos, there were drops of blood on the outside walkway leading to the front door of the house, and there was a large smear of blood on the outside of the front door frame, also shown in police photos. And remember, when the paramedics arrived, they saw this blood at that point, and they also noted that the front door was wide open. Michael and Kathleen had been at the back of the house. He entered the house through the back, and there'd be no reason for the front door to be open unless Kathleen had run through it earlier that night in a frantic state, leaving the door open behind her because it was more important to get to safety than to shut the door. Advocates of this theory also claim the evidence shows that Kathleen was bleeding before she got to the staircase due to those drops of blood outside and that the blood was spattered up the staircase rather than down the staircase and the fact that there was blood on the bottom of her feet showed that Kathleen had stood up in her own blood at some point. The front door was open, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, there's there's some compelling evidence there, honestly. There really, really is. Uh, I can see why there's a group of people who believe this because it does explain some of the things uh, that we're questioning in this uh, in this case. And the way it's laid out, the way you just laid it out as far as the twig and the shape of the cuts and the blood on the front door and the door being ajar. Uh, why would the that feather door be ajar? in her hand, the feather in her hand, that micro feather in her hand? There's a lot there that. Because it's so rare to have this whole situation play out the way it did, it's almost so too hard to believe, which is why they went with the husband killed her. But damn, I don't, I'm kind of speechless. I didn't know those. I didn't know those facts to be. Comp- I, I wish I had more to say, but I'm like, holy shit! That you're processing. That's absolutely possible that that happened based on what we said there. I guess if I'm gonna like call out a couple things. You know, the owl comes in through the front door with her, right? Like if she's attacked. No. You're thinking the owl, all the injuries happen outside and then she runs in. Yeah. So the owl wouldn't be inside the house for later to be captured, right? That's, I'm trying to poke holes in this, not because I I don't want to believe it, but because I want to be skeptical of this theory to try to say like, hey, there's some, there's some issues here. The owls are going to like attack defensively, but they're not going to like pursue. Like an owl's not going to chase you into your house. But if an owl feels threatened, it will like fuck you up, you know? Yeah. And then, and, and then, you know, you'll run away. But they, they fly so quietly. They have these like specific feathers that are like sort of like sharp, almost like a razor on one end. And it makes it so that they can fly through the air silent. They scare the shit out of me. They fly through the air silently. So you don't even know it's coming. Like, remember that one lady said, and she felt like she got punched in the head, in the back of the head by somebody who was wearing rings. They come out of nowhere and they like, bam, attack your head, usually because you have hair and they think you're like an animal, another animal. So they'll bang, attack your head, and you don't even know what's happening. And all you need to do, because you don't even realize it's an owl at first, is you're lifting your your hands to protect yourself and trying to grab whatever it is. Then you figure out it's a bird, and you're, like, trying to pull it off. But they will latch on, too. I just saw a TikTok where two owls in, I think it was, like, an owl, like, farm or something. I don't know. They got, like, latched together because they, like, tailed each other, and nobody would let go. So they have very, very strong feet, and they, like, will latch on, and she would be trying to pull it off, which is the, why they're saying she had hair on her hands, her own hair in her hands, um, and then the feather in her hand. And that's where the pine needles came from. And honestly, the reindeer ornaments being there did stand out to me because, remember, Kathleen was was mad that she had the conference call the next day because they were supposed to decorate for Christmas. So they hadn't decorated for Christmas yet. Um, it was supposed to be happening that Sunday. So on her way in, she's probably like, well, I'm just pull these out while I'm here, you know, while I'm outside. I'm just going to pull these out and put the reindeer ornaments out in the lawn. And then at least I'll have done that. And that'll be one less thing I have to do tomorrow. And it'll kind of make up for the time that I have to be on the conference call. Maybe she planned to do that because they had not started decorating for Christmas yet. So it does appear that those reindeer ornaments went up that night. Yeah, that I still think that theory sounds incredible the way it's laid out and how it's supported by some of the evidence that we know to be true. I will say I know the house is big. I've seen like the satellite image and I know where Michael allegedly was in the backyard with the pool and Mm -hmm. she was in the front. I still would think at that time of night, even in a big home, 
I don't live in a mansion, but you know, even in a big home, if you're, if someone was screaming, and I guess you could argue that she wasn't yelling because she was surprised, but if she was being attacked, I would think she would scream. And if it were quiet outside, I, if Michael had heard something, he absolutely would have said that in his testimony because it would have supported this this owl theory. Like, hey, I heard her yelling, I heard her screaming, so I ran inside and I found her. You know, that that would be more believable. The fact that this was done. By the silent attacker, which, you know, he was able, the owl was able to attack her and she didn't make a single noise or he didn't hear it. So they did, they did tests with like microphones and everything out by the pool with the fountain on as it was. And no, you can't hear you anything. Can't hear like anything, they even huh? had mics and stuff. What's more like, you know, I don't want to say concerning, but what's more like surprising to me is like no neighbors would hear her screaming. You know, if Nobody. he can't hear out by back by the pool, like, I don't know how close the nearest house is, though. You know, I know Larry Pollard lived right next door. So I don't know how close the nearest house is. It did seem like they were kind of isolated. So if they were isolated and surrounded by woods, probably no neighbors would have heard either. Can't really poke holes in what the kind of the theory that's laid out there. And you could argue that because of what was found, they reverse engineered it to fit this theory, right? If they If they want to believe this is what happened, just like in any other case. Unfortunately... And we're not going to put them here. But there are photos of Kathleen Peterson on those stairs. And I, I have looked at them. And to me, I can't really poke holes in the owl theory per se. But I would caution anyone who fully believes this because it still doesn't explain the cast off, in my opinion, on the stairs. And I, I've said it numerous times, I'm not a blood spatter expert, but to me... That cast off appears to be from some rapid movement that was taking place on the stairs because the cuts are on her head, the back of her head. She had long hair. The hair is covering it. So you would see in like a movie situation where if someone gets cut a certain way, they can bleed a lot and there can be spray. I've seen it personally. It's not pretty. But when you have that much hair covering it, usually it will deflect the blood before it's spraying out all over the place. It'll kind of get absorbed like a sponge by your hair. Mm -hmm. So for me, just my get my opinion, the cast off would be caused by her whipping her hair back and forth or someone mm -hmm. whipping her head back and forth for her. And the blood that's on the hair is now casting off onto the wall as her hair is whipping back and forth. Mm -hmm. I don't see why she would be making that motion if she was sitting on the stairs bleeding out where she'd be whipping her hair back and forth. And that's why I'm, I'm apprehensive about completely buying into this owl theory. It does fit. I got to say, it. <laughs> I mean, you laid it out perfectly right there, but I, I'm still apprehensive about it. I, I don't really have anything concrete to say, nope, not possible. This is too far fetched. But that's, that's the one thing as I'm sitting here right now, looking at photos on my computer while talking to you guys, that blood spatter cast off that it looks like high velocity blood spatter cast off to me, the small droplets, that's some type of motion to me. And I don't know why she would be doing that on the stairs if she was bleeding to death. I think that um, the wounds on her head, the owl attack is the best theory to explain those because we don't think they were made by a blow poke. A blow poke would have broken if you're hitting a skull. It's thin, it's hollow, it's not like a super strong instrument it could be stairs but i feel like if you're hitting somebody's head into the stairs you're going to see some deeper fractures you're going to see some underlying hemorrhage something like that agreed so the the talons do seem to be like the most likely kind of explanation and in 2010 three affidavits were actually submitted by three expert witnesses who backed up this owl theory dr patrick reddick who was a professor of veterinary medicine at the university of minnesota he said the owl theory was entirely within the behavior and repertoire of large owls dr alan van norman a neurosurgeon and owl expert said that the wounds on kathleen's head looked more like they came from a pair of three taloned owl feet rather than a blunt instrument saying quote the multiple wounds presented suggested to me that an owl and Miss Peterson somehow became entangled. Perhaps the owl got tangled in her hair, or perhaps she grabbed the owl's foot. End quote. And Kate Davis said the lacerations, quote, look very much like those made by a raptor's talons, especially if she had forcibly torn the bird from the back of her head. End quote. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, 
if if we found out later that it was an owl, I would not be shocked based on what you're laying out. Very really compelling evidence. And in a case like this where we don't know with 100% certainty what happened, it's not even like really obvious to us based on what we've gone over. I would say this case has me scratching my head. Yeah, right? I still don't know. I have an opinion and I'm definitely going to give my opinion and I will say, this is why we wait. I will say I was, I felt better about it before the owl theory. I won't even lie to you. Better about it before the owl theory and before literally seeing the prosecution and all of their witnesses bending over backwards to make sure that like no evidence was shown to the jury that exonerated him. Maybe I'll get myself in trouble for this. That doesn't bother me as much. It, it bothers me from a, from a, from a system, a systematic perspective where I know that this shouldn't happen and that in this case there was a lot of it i will tell you that in, in this case it seems to be true i'm not i'm not trying to discredit it or say it's not a, or minimize it uh, but i will say that i've had it happen to me numerous times too where you'll have uh defense attorneys try to discredit you if they can't discredit the evidence and and, and it seems like here based on everything you said justly so there was a lot of things going on where it shouldn't have happened, and some of it appears to have happened after this trial, right, where some of this information became apparent with Deaver and stuff like that after the trial. So, yeah, totally for it, and regardless of when it's learned, it should be exposed, and they should go back and look at previous cases that these individuals worked. But um, So the fact that there was no blood reportedly on his T-shirt does not bother you? It does bother me. Honestly, okay. it does. It bothers me because if you're to believe that he assaulted her and again, the hair whipping theory, well, her hair is going to whip back and forth and he would be in front of or behind her and it would whip in his direction. So there would have to be some cleaning. Could he have changed his shirt? Yeah, I guess he could have. But as we said earlier, there were witnesses that saw him in a similar shirt. So I don't know. It's and where'd the shirt go? Like, where where'd the where shirt did go? the shirt go? Now he had three hours. So yeah. a lot can happen in or two hours, whatever the time frame window is, a lot can happen. There could be some major cleanup and things can go missing. Could have mm -hmm. buried it somewhere for all we know. But yeah, the owl theory, I will say I, this is the first for Crime Weekly where I kind of feel like by the last episode, I got everything where I need to be. And then I've known about the owl theory. I kind of assumed that I would take it seriously, but not really believe it was possible. And I'm, I'm sitting here actually thinking like yeah that that does make sense <laughs> like i think that's how everyone feels about the owl theory though. well how do you like, feel about it you didn't weigh in do you think so that the same the same thing as you i was like the freaking owl theory but i did hear remember it was crime con a couple years ago they had a whole panel and a whole segment about the owl theory and i watched it and i was like yeah. whoa this is legit like and and before that i was like owl theory what are you talking about this sounds like some random like sounds like a jose Baez defense right <laughs> like something he just came up with like pulled out of his ass throw it against the wall see if it works but when you look deeper into it like yeah given the time of year given the species given that they're territorial given that it's their mating time so they're going to be even more territorial given the wounds on her head that really can't be explained by anything else given the feather in her hand and her hair in her hand why did that happen you know Things like that, like the whole, the front door being open and the blood being found outside the house and then inside the house, unless, you know, she was chased by somebody into the house and, and hit before she even got inside. And maybe you could explain it that way and say, well, she was being pursued by Michael Peterson and she was outside and then ran in through the front door. But if you're being pursued by your husband who's trying to kill you, why are you running back in the house? You know, why won't you run to the street? So that doesn't really make sense. It sounded like she was running into the house because she felt there was safety there. And you wouldn't feel that way if you were being pursued by your husband who's trying to kill you. So, yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to just scoff at it, I guess. Yeah, it's hard to scoff at it. And this is why those bloody footprints that were marked on a sketch pad would have been great to have. A, a photo with a scale because you could see the size of the footprint and is it more in line with Michael Peterson or is it more in line with Kathleen Peterson? Which, if they even existed. Yeah. Well, if it, if they exist, you know, I guess one other thing to just try to like poke holes in this because that's what we have to approach it like this. If I get attacked by someone or an animal, I should say, and I'm bleeding profusely and I'm I'm struggling, I'm going to try and go back to whoever I know is in the house. And the last place that she had seen Michael and this would have been moments after leaving him. I'm running towards the back door to try to get out to my husband to to help to have him help me. I'm not trying to run up the stairs 
uh, for whatever reason. I'm running towards him to say, help me, I'm bleeding. So you know, I... here's here's their answer for that because I okay, thought the same thing. We, I we thought go. the same thing. Yo, we think the same because I was like, why am I running upstairs? Like, oh, I got to check by now. Well, time for bed. You know, like I'm about to go. I'm going to be like to my husband, like, yo, an owl just attacked me, man. Like, because it's crazy, you know? But what they said was, listen, A, She's super independent. She's super like, you know, got her own thing going. She don't need no man. She doesn't go to her husband and say, can you patch me up? B, um, she didn't know how badly she was injured because uh, these lacerations in your head bleed very profusely, but they don't always have to be like a drastic sort of wound. So she didn't know how bad she was wounded and she may have been going upstairs to her bathroom where the first aid kit was so that she could get like alcohol and stuff to like clean it out. Because when you get attacked by an owl, you have to worry about like diseases that birds are carrying. You know, like I have chickens and I love my chickens and they're clean, but every time I touch them, pick them up or anything, I wash my hands every time because animals have diseases. So she may have said, oh shit, I got attacked by this owl or this bird. I've got to get like alcohol on these on these cuts before like so that it doesn't get infected. You know, mm -hmm. so she was heading upstairs to where the first aid kit was. Yeah, I guess. I, I, I guess it's because then the theory is, okay, she's injured from the owl. She's bleeding. She's still coherent. She's still able to move. She's still able to function. She's not in a bad place yet. It's when she's going up the stairs, she's bleeding. She slips because she's wearing these clear plastic sandals. Maybe there's a little bit of blood getting on there and yeah. she slips. And that's when she hits her head or something and she gets even more injured. So now she's laying there. And more disoriented. Yeah. More disoriented. Can't really get up. Maybe tries to get up, but can't. And she bleeds out. And I think like she fell once, probably bled from her head onto the floor, you know, and then the blood's slippery now and now she's falling again. Yeah. You know, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a strong theory. This is definitely a first for us two years in where it's kind of like, wow, last episode of a series and a curveball is thrown in the ninth inning. It's crazy. So before we get into final thoughts, I sort of want to finish this series out with the recent allegations. I guess they're not recent. I think it was like in 2021, so a couple of years ago. But Todd Peterson made some allegations against his father. And remember, for a long time, Todd was Michael's most fervent supporter. But here is what Todd said in this live stream that he posted on Instagram in 2021 after the death of his mother, Patty. I'm literally about to have the worst experience of my entire life. I'm about to call the cops my father for the murder of my mother, Patricia Peterson. I now today realize that the motivation was money. Just like I now believe Kathleen. I didn't really realize it all until uh, I tried to break my sobriety a couple of weeks ago. My own father tried to break my sobriety. That's actually how I figured out he's a serial killer. Until then, I was blind and stupid and thought he wouldn't hurt a family member and well. If you want to break your own son's sobriety, do anything. I was a fall down drunk. I'm not a good guy. I'm not a good guy. I am now, but if you judge me against my whole lifetime, I've done some fucking horrible shit. Former alcoholic, drug addict. Three years ago, it's a top running American. The sixth most dangerous city in the world. Selling real estate. I think sure what I was doing. But I knew that when I was a fall down drunk, man. I was losing my car once a week. I'm sorry, once a month. It wasn't this one. I had a cool, cool Jeep. Such, so, such a drunk, man. I was losing my car once a month. I was passing out on the street. Literally waking up at like 6 in the morning. In the sixth most dangerous city in the world. You know, I was an alcoholic for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm going to head over to the house now because I just discovered today the final pieces that made it all sense, okay? I didn't go to my mom's funeral about four months ago. She was my best friend. I was with her when she, uh, the day she died, I was with her when she died. My father waited three hours while my mom was having a heart attack, didn't call the cops. When I came over within seven minutes, I called the cops, or the 911. My mom would be alive today if it weren't for my father. Anyways, it's all about this, man. About the insurance, uh, when they got divorced, my mom ended up with all the stuff my dad wanted. It's unbelievable. So petty. You know, my dad wanted the, uh, 
My dad wanted like this like George V teapot. Sterling silver teapot. You know, it's not a lot. I mean, you know, my mom probably has a couple hundred thousand, maybe half a million of artwork. Maybe, maybe a million, but more importantly, the easy to see stuff is this called silverware. It's easy because it's silver and it's, it should be there. All gone. All gone. Obviously, down the street. Another conversation I'll talk about the bizarre behavior of my father immediately after my mother's death and him taking all this stuff. My mom died in front of me twice, actually. I saved her the first time. Her body failed her, so we had to pull the plug on her, which is the most inhumane thing in the world. But I brought my mom back from death the first time. But we both agree, my dad and I, I mean, she died while, we were, while I was on the phone with 911. Anyways, I couldn't go back in the house for a while. So finally I asked my dad to help me get things moving because I couldn't set foot in the house. Well, by the second or third day, it was pretty awful. By the fourth day, I think that's when he tried to break my sobriety. I have it all on notes, but it's a fucking monster. Anyways, you know, he's a sociopath. He goes hot, he goes cold. This is my, uh, this is my health card. My mom had an account for us and she wanted to pay for insurance for me. I haven't had insurance in 20 years. I don't believe that. But we have a joint shared account um, on this, okay? And me, my mom, and my dad, okay? Money comes out of here for the insurance that she makes me get. Well, last night, payment failure, okay? Uh, so, I'm gonna go pull out the money for the year. We're actually going to pull it all out. It's like 500 bucks or so for the insurance for the year. But more importantly, I'm doing that to show that my father is erratic because this is what I believe he'll do. I believe he's going to text me messages now calling me irresponsible and horrible and, you know, whatever, you know. He's going to blame it on me, even though he has literally stolen all of this stuff. It is my belief that he's going to go hot and cold because he doesn't know to call the cops on him. See, I never thought my dad would kill Kathleen or my mom because I didn't think he would hurt his own family member. I literally needed my own personal experience where he tried to hurt me and ruin my life and my alcoholism. I needed that personal experience to see nothing would prevent him from doing anything. I mean, if he'd ruin his own child's alcohol sobriety where I've been clean for three years, if Kathleen was going to leave him, which was a very strange final conversation that she had with me. Uh, the last conversation that she had with me. Uh, you know, it's not a smoking gun at all. But it's very strange because it, it was basically her talking about how she believed that in life you have three relationships, one in your 20s, you know, 25 to 35, 145 to 55 and then the other one from like you know 60 to the rest of your life well my dad was the uh the second relationship there he wasn't the third one because kathleen was like in her 40 late 40s i think or early 50s it was the weirdest damn conversation i have ever seen and i didn't ever see anything so obviously i didn't think my dad did it and it was it would have been a very harmful conversation to have jury had heard about because if she left him, he would have had to move out of the house of 1810 Cedar Street because he didn't have the cash flow. Because his books were getting rejected left and right. And while he did have good news about a movie, that stuff is pie in the sky and is statistically unlikely. Whereas the fact that his financial stress was very real. If she had left him, he would have been devastated. It is true they had the world's greatest relationship. They never fought. They literally had the world's greatest relationship. You can talk to any girl I've ever dated bad boyfriend. I blame my father for that one, called bad parenting and made me a bad person, but I'm a good person now, but I was a very bad boyfriend for many years. And admittedly, I haven't been in a relationship since I got sober. And I think it's best just to be very devout and, and not burden other women with me, frankly speaking. So I'm assuming I'm a good person now, but I can't say it for fact. But unbelievably, my dad and Kathleen actually had the world's greatest relationship. I do not know how it's possible. <laughs> I think he's gay, for the record. I know he's bisexual, but I've never seen that man have a heterosexual experience that was authentic in my life. Other than they did have a great relationship with Kathleen, but that dude 
he goes off when he sees men. I've never seen him go off when he sees a woman. Anyways, I can't believe I'm going to call the cops on my own fucking father, man. I was widely regarded as the toughest white guy in the most dangerous city in the world. This is cartel land about three years ago. I want to just say to people to the people down there and, you know, that would maybe frown upon this. I'm not ratting my dad out. This guy's a fucking serial killer, man. And he's a monster. I told my mom that he was going to kill her. I actually told her that. And I made my peace with that because she didn't want to hear it. So personally, I don't think there's much to this. Todd, admittedly, as he said, you know, in this video, has been struggling with his own demons, his own addictions. He doesn't seem to be super stable. And I, I looked into this and it looks like the financial motive that he's talking about where he's like, oh, it's money. It's about money. It, it appears that he's speaking about some silverware, like silverware that belonged to Patty. Um, and I don't I don't understand why Michael Peterson would just let his ex-wife die in front of him so that he could get her silverware, especially after what happened with Elizabeth Ratliff and Kathleen. Like, is he really going to want to be in the same house as another woman, another woman that he's married to dying, you know, and, and, and have to deal with with that for some silverware? You know, there's not even life insurance money at stake here. And at the time of her death, Patty and Michael were still quite close. She'd stood by him throughout everything. I even believe that they were living together at this time as roommates. Like after he got out of prison, they got a, a two bedroom like condo together in Durham, I think. And, and they lived together. Clayton, their son, said that his parents were companions and they took care of each other at this time. So I guess Michael did call his sons and say Patty wasn't feeling well, and apparently Todd got upset, and they, you know, he was like, did you call 911? And Michael was like, no. And I guess, like, Todd and maybe even Clayton felt that Michael should have called the police before he called then, but he probably didn't know what was going on with Patty, and I'm sure, like, honestly, if I'm being fair to Michael Peterson— I don't even want to call 911 at this point. Like, I don't want to even bring this to my doorstep again. Like, if I don't have to call 911 and maybe she's just not feeling well. And I will say, like, I think she had a heart attack. Heart attacks look very different in men than they do in women, by the way. Like, the symptoms of a heart attack in a woman look incredibly different than they would for a man. So maybe he just didn't think it was a heart attack and he thought she was just not feeling well. I don't think there's anything nefarious here. I certainly don't think that he just let her die and refused to call the police. And I think that Todd has had problems for a long time. And I mean, even the people who are against Michael Peterson, um, Aphrodite Jones and um, Diane Fanning, who wrote books about Michael Peterson. And clearly, you know, this all th these books were written before the Dwayne Deaver stuff came out. So they were very anti Michael Peterson. Even they say like, Todd's action-packed with issues, man. Okay, like no offense to Todd. He's action-packed with issues. He always has been. It seemed like both Clayton and Todd, you know, had their their growing pains. Clayton grew out of it and kind of settled and Todd really never did. So what's going on now? Who knows? But there could be a lot of motives for Todd doing this regardless. Uh, apparently, you know, there was an investigation done and, and nobody thinks that there's any foul play, although like, I don't really trust like Durham law enforcement at this point. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't think there's anything to it. What do you think? There could be some truth in what he's saying. You know, I it is hard because you have to judge the credibility of the source. And as he said numerous times in the video, he's not a good person. He thinks he's a good person now, but he's not sure. So, you know, you have to take that into consideration when he doesn't even know uh, what type of person he is. And there may be some truth to what he's saying. Uh, a lot of it's speculative on his part as far as motive. He did say some things at the end of the video where he said he he helped facilitate potential hits on people outside the prison while Michael was in prison. I would love to know more about that because that's something that you probably could verify as an investigator. But as far as motive, it, he's putting pieces together based on things he's experiencing. It doesn't mean it's true. He, he goes on to state that he believes his father was was homosexual and just because he'd never really, I guess, like showed that he was into women outside of. But he always would show, I guess, if an attractive man came by, he had more he was more into kind of you know showing that he had interest or whatever. I didn't really know where he was going with that. But overall, none of that says definitively that he killed Kathleen Peterson. It's just more of just his opinion 
which doesn't hold a ton of weight because he's coming out with that information at a time where he's angry at his father. So there's definitely an agenda there. Is it is it because now he's telling the truth because he's mad or he, now he's em- embellishing certain stories that he has with his father because he's he's angry with him and is trying to get back at him? I think that his mother just died. Um, he was mourning. He was upset. It was traumatic when somebody's already sort of like not like you said, he doesn't even know who he is. You know, he's a grown man and he doesn't know where he stands and what's going on. And so when you're not super like steady in yourself and something like this happens, it can be staggering. It can take you back many steps. And I think he was lashing out and angry and hurt, basically hurt, which comes out as anger in people that don't know how to illustrate that they're hurt. And I think he just was lashing out. I mean, he hasn't really said anything since. As far as, you know, him saying that he thought his father was just gay and it didn't like women, that's, I think that's false. Even the prosecution brought out or found multiple women that Michael Peterson had had, you know, sexual relations with in the past who who they talked to because they were trying to figure out, you know, had he given any indication of being gay back then when he was younger. But, you know, he dated women. He dated men. Um, Yeah, it feels like he's just saying stuff like he's just venting and having this like therapy session in front of the world. Um, And, you know, I think it's sad and I feel bad for him. And his mother died. That's upsetting. Like, and it was unexpected. So it's a heart attack. It's not even like she was sick and you knew this was coming. She just suddenly died. And and sometimes when things happen that we can't explain and we don't understand why, we need to point the finger and blame someone. And we have to find a way to, to explain it. And I think that was his way. Yeah, very possible. Do you want to get into final thoughts? Yeah, let's get into final thoughts, man. You go first because I'm you. sure you have more final thoughts than me. Yeah, well, it's kind of a little... A little messed up now, but we're going to go with it anyway. So to kind of go back and and talk about some things that we talked about earlier in this series, we talked about motive and premeditation, all these things right off the the jump. I don't think this was a premeditated murder. I don't, even if it was only a matter of uh, minutes before, if anything, this was a crime of passion, but, but we, we talked a lot about Michael and Kathleen's relationship and there really wasn't anything over the top that would suggest a reason for motive to want to kill them, uh, to kill Kathleen. And I will say this, like thinking about it more. Cause I, you know, even in your off time, think about this, this family dynamic and something there. And it, it was something you said to me very early on when you were kind of given us the foundation uh, of this case and giving us some backstories and you talked about, and by the way, if I'm wrong on any of this, correct me, but I believe you said to us that Kathleen had divorced her previous husband for infidelity, correct? Yes. Okay. Fred, yeah. So clearly it's something that she's not okay with. That's not yeah. speculative. It's happened. And from what you've said, although the, the, the emails weren't with, with Brent weren't too over the top, Michael himself had, have, has indicated that he has slept with other people while married to Kathleen. Is that fair to say? It sounded like that to me. Yeah, that's what okay. it sounded like to me. So if Kathleen was aware of this, I don't think she would be okay with it. And then you couple that with the financial issues that they were having, which in and of themselves, I don't think it would be enough to kill someone. But the fact that they had over $100,000 in debt, her stepsons from another marriage were struggling financially. And I'm sure he was still talking to her about it, even though he said he wasn't. There was a lot going on there. Then you couple that with the fact that she may have gone in the desk and she's seen these photos and emails, she she probably has a pretty good indication that Michael's sleeping around on her. And could that, could that cause an argument after a couple drinks? Absolutely. Yeah. Could it, could I know Todd said in his, even the video, oh, they were the perfect couple. They never fought. Well, sometimes people compartmentalize things and before they blow up and this might've been the night that they blew up. So before the owl theory, I was going to say that I'm, I'm leaning 60 40 in 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 the direction that he did intentionally kill her that this was a homicide it was a crime of passion and there was a couple things that got me there the main thing was the blood spatter i've said it multiple episodes i just feel like that blood spatter to replicate that blood spatter uh from any other way other than an assault it would be very difficult to me because i would expect that if she was sitting there bleeding she would be struggling to get up. There would be hand more hand smudges on the wall, things to show like she was kind of, I hate to say this, but like slipping around in her own blood. There were a lot of hand smudges. I on saw the wall. them. I did. And that's why I'm saying more. That's why I'm saying mm-hmm. more. I, I would expect more. more, but a couple quick things I'll hit on them. We've already, you guys know about these uh, for the most of you had taken notes, but I just said the blood spatter. 
I think the cleaning of the blood, although if you look at the photo of the crime scene, the paper towels are there. It's not like he was doing a massive cleanup where he was going to each stair cleaning up. But still to me, I still find it odd that you, as you're sitting there with your wife, the love of your life, you would even consider going to get paper towels unless it was for anything other than to maybe like dry off the blood on her head. Uh, but it doesn't seem like that's what he's saying to law enforcement. He's saying, I did a little bit of cleaning up of the area, which if we're wrong in that interpretation, that's on us. But that sound, is that sound right? Am I wrong in how I'm saying that? No, it sounded like he kind of just, yeah, like got some paper towels, got some towels to put under her head and then sort of like took a paper towel roll and was kind of, I don't even think he took paper towels off the roll. It looked like he just took the whole roll and sort of like. Yeah, the roll's there. You can see it. He might have, there might have been some paper towels thrown away. I don't know. Yeah. That that bothered me. And none of this in and of itself is like, oh, smoking gun. He's guilty. Then you have the calls to 911. He makes the first call. Okay. And within, what was it, seven minutes, something like that, he makes a second call saying she's dead. I have never had a situation in 13 years on the job as a patrolman, as a sergeant. I've had multiple calls where I show up and the person's deceased by the time I get there. They've probably been dead for 10, 20 minutes. But I've never had a relative in that moment say, oh, we just wanted to call back. They're already dead. And the reason for that is normally they, they're not doctors, so they don't know if they're dead or not. Yes, they might not feel a pulse or breathing or whatever, but they don't know if they're still there. And secondly, there's a sense of urgency. They want you, their protectors, the people that are supposed to help them to get there as fast as possible to maybe bring them back or do what you need to do. So I don't see the relevance to call and say, oh, she's she's dead now. She's dead. I, I, don't, I don't get that. That was a little odd to me. It almost sounded a little set up like maybe after the first call, she might have already been dead. But he couldn't make it look that way, so he has to call in again so that when first responders arrive, the fact that she's already deceased and some of the blood is dried up a little bit, it maybe makes more sense because what did she die the second they showed up? I thought that was a little odd. Injury to the neck. Even though the owl theory has some has some legs to it, no pun intended there, I feel <laughs> like the injury to the neck, although it could be a red herring, it could be nothing with the case it could just be as we talked about something that was fractured during the autopsy by the pathologist it wouldn't be professional of us not to acknowledge it that there are some people that believe it could be a sign of suffocation it could have been a situation where they're fighting he begins to strangle her and it, it, she fights back or whatever and he's banging her head off the staircase and ultimately this is the result of it but yeah i do think it would be a crime of passion i don't think it would be this premeditated murder uh, i think in the act of assaulting her Maybe just to hurt her, it escalated to a homicide, uh, but that would be the most for me. So what? So you don't think any murder weapon was used? Absolutely not. You think not, he yeah. hit her head against the stairs? Yep. I think it was, and that's more what you would see with a crime of passion where it no is in the moment. No blood on his shirt. No blood on his shirt. Yeah, that bothers me. I'm not going to lie to yeah. you. It could be directional where the blood is spatting in one direction as he's hitting her and he's lucky enough where it doesn't get on him. I said to this to you, I don't know, we've taken some breaks tonight, but I, I would expect to see blood, a lot of blood on his chest. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. We were talking about the hair back and forth. That was in the episode. So yeah, we also we talked off the episode about how much blood was on Kathleen on the bottom of Kathleen's feet. And like it kind of takes us both aback where it's like clearly to me at one point she she stood up in her own blood. Yep. I agree. I agree. So When did that happen? There is a part of me that thinks maybe during the struggle she's bleeding and she's trying to use. She's trying to stand up. She's trying to sit up. She's trying to push herself away and she's slipping in her own blood as she's, as she's struggling because he's suffocating her. He's hitting her where she tries to get her feet tucked underneath her and she's kicking and she just can't get her grip because of how much blood again, totally speculative, but it's one of those things where you have to acknowledge, is that possible? Yeah, it is. It's possible. That could be the case where she's sitting on the stairs fighting for her life. And as she's got her feet underneath her. She's bleeding all over the place and she's slipping in her own blood. And that could explain the blood on her feet because I will say, I do not recommend going and look at the photos, but the blood, I would expect if there was, if she was walking around, her, your feet would compress and the majority of the foot would be covered in blood pretty flat. If you look at the photos, it seems more like it's almost like the edge of her foot kicking and not necessarily, I don't know. It's, 
it again, looks you, like the whole bottom to me. Like she was stepping around, walking through it, though? Yes. And even the defense, I mean, even the prosecution says that's what it looks like. The entire bottom of her feet. It's so odd. And it still, it still could happen from her trying to stand up in her pool of, a pool of blood. But all that said, that was before the owl theory. And I didn't hear anything in the owl theory that was ridiculous to me. And frankly there's still a very strong possibility that this was an accident and that she did just fall down the stairs. That's just the truth. But if you, if you put a gun in my head and said, Hey, where are you leaning? That's where I would have been leaning. But I will say if I was 60, 40 before the owl theory, now I'm kind of 50, 50 where I think it's either a crime of passion or this is such a rare freak accident involving an animal that it's so hard to believe people can't rationalize that she may have been attacked by an owl ran into the house and slipped and fell in her own blood as, or even just slipped going up those slippery wooden stairs, increased the injuries that she sustained, got a concussion and then bled out from the injuries sustained by the owl. Obviously a one in a million chance that that would happen, but it's possible. And I think when you can't as a, as a prosecutor, or as a detective, you can't get there. You automatically go to husband had to do it. So I would say, yeah, for the fr- I'm 50-50 with that whole thing. I do not think – I think it's less likely that this was just a pure accident, but I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me there. I think the owl theory is may- way more believable than just her coming down the stairs or going up the stairs for the night and slipping. It doesn't explain a lot of the things we're seeing. I think <laughs> – I don't know, man, but I think an accident, an accidental fall is based on like the blood and what it looks like in the staircase. I think it's possible. And I was telling you once again, I think we were off camera and we weren't, you know, being recording, but I was just filming a movie at a very old house built in the 1800s. And it had one of these back servant staircases and it's a very narrow and they're very dark and I mean like narrow and then they turn at a very extreme angle and the the stairs kind of like the end, the edge of the stairs kind of like round off so you, you could literally just slip if you get your a wrong footing and she was wearing these like weird clear sandals these plastic clear sandals she was drinking she could have been walking up the stairs slipped at the top and fallen down to the point where maybe she fell backwards. So that's why you don't see blood on a lot of the steps and it hit like foo backwards, like kind of flew backwards, hit her head on the wall or the stairs and started bleeding. And then she's like, oh no. And she gets up and starts trying to like walk away, but she's losing blood so fast that she then slumps down. Like, I think that's possible. If you had to ask me right now, like, would I vote this guy guilty if I was on a jury? No. Oh, I mean, no, I wouldn't. We haven't even got there yet. The one thing I want to say doesn't mean I'm right. If this was an accident, and I know this isn't the way the prosecution laid it out, or or I should say the defense laid it out, but I whole, wholeheartedly believe that if this was an accident, I don't know why she was up there, but I think it's more likely that she was coming down the stairs. And I think that because I've done this before in my life where that rounded edge that you're talking about, your heel catches it and it slips out and you crack your skull off the stair where if she's walking up the stairs, if anything, and I've done this too, I think we all have, you're running up the stairs or something to get something because the kids are fighting or whatever you fall forward and you, and you, and you miss the stair, right? Like your sl- foot slips out and you fall flat mm-hmm. on your face or on your forearms. Yeah. It's so hard to fall backwards where it's like, what? it's like a movie, right? Where that's how you would fall. I think it's much more likely she's walking around. She goes upstairs. She forgets something downstairs. She's got those mm-hmm. slippery sandals on. She's on the stair and she might have hit like four or five stairs on the way down as she's, as she's going down them, which would pot- potentially explain this. So I'm not going to sit here and say that you think it's an accident. You're wrong. And I, and what you just said there was where I was going to say next, which is regardless of what camp you're in, owl, uh, crime of passion or an accident. I don't think there's there's so much reasonable doubt here. I don't see how a jury came to the conclusion that he was guilty. And I also don't see why Michael I know it's a I know it's a risk, but I would have never taken an Alfred plea with all of this reasonable doubt in there. I would have never I would have I would have went for it because I would have taken it. I would have yeah, taken it in I a freaking second because 
No. Because the jur- cause they wouldn't have offered it if they thought they had me. Yeah. Have you been to prison, though? Like, no, I mean, I'm not taking no, my chances. I haven't been to prison. No. no, I haven't been to prison. But I would have because you have to know that if you take the Alfred plea, your life's over anyways. Your life is over. And even it, to some degree, it already is because in the court of public opinion, they're going to think what they want. But by taking that Alfred plea, I know there are a lot of people are going to say, oh, he took it because it was a lesser sentence. So he got away with it. And, you know, he, he, he does a, a short period of time and he's out. But yeah, I mean, this is a first for us. On yeah, this... I think he took it because he was desperate. Desperation will do a lot to you. Like, I don't or want to guilty. spend another freaking day behind bars, you know, like desperation. It's like, it's not even fair, honestly, to no. offer somebody something like that, knowing they'll do anything to get out of prison. It's like offering a hungry man food and saying, like, if I give you this food, you're indebted to me for some reason, but you're starving. So you're going to take it. And that's exactly what happened. Like, it's it's really not not fair. I, I, I couldn't have found him guilty if I was no, on a jury. Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. Mm. Look at this. We and we've had this before, but we completely agree on this case and yet we have no clue what happened after five <laughs> no parts. Clue. It's like, you know, anything's possible. But I feel like that's our responsibility. We're not just here to tell you something because, oh, we have to make a decision. I feel like this case was was polarizing because of these exact circumstances and a yeah. lot of people feel this way. And I had people DMing us on the Crime Weekly Instagram, oh, he's not guilty. I had some people saying he was. I had some people in the true crime space be like, I don't think he, I don't think there's enough there. And it wasn't until we went through it where now I see it. Now I get it. Mm-hmm. And I can see why people are really troubled by this one. And and depending on who you talk to, everyone has an opinion. But damn, I never thought I would leave this going, that owl theory? Yeah. Sounds yeah, legit. I can see it. <laughs> I mean, what other theory that we talked about explains the explains the twig, explains the door being open, explains the micro feathers? Tell, which one? Which one? None of them. The only one is the owl theory. Kind of crazy, right? And that's evidence that's not manipulated, right? That's what I'm talking about. When you're following the evidence, as as extreme and crazy as it sounds, yeah, there's a feather in her. You know, she has her own hair in her hands. She's got the micro feather. That's it. Was that in her hands as well? Yes, right. Yeah, in the hair. In in her hands, yeah. and she's got the twig in her in her actual hair. Blood on the front door, door front door ajar. When I'm assuming, did Michael confirm that she came in through the front door? That she didn't go in through the back door after they she left the pool. He was sleeping, so he wouldn't have known, right? No, he wasn't sleeping. Well, he doesn't say he was sleeping, but she went in through the back door, right? Or he doesn't, you know, say whether she did. Because remember, I like I said, there the pool's down there, and then you walk up, you wouldn't see. If she went into what door? You just see her like disappear. It's kind of like lower. So she could have gone in through any door and he wouldn't have known which door she used to go through. But why was the front door open? Yeah. Why was the front door open? Yeah, I agree. And I know there's been a lot of comments. uh, There were people who were talking about the behavior panel uh, as far as their assessment. And they went a big uh, majorly on not only the evidence, but also uh, the body language of Michael Peterson. Listen, they're looking at it from a different angle. I think. I haven't watched it, but what did I they say from the comments there, they don't even necessarily believe that they were at the pool that Michael said they were at and he was much closer to the house. But I know from the series, they definitely think he's guilty. Uh, they think that he was more storytelling than than regurgitating facts. And so, I mean, listen, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. But we live in a country where you're going to have to show me some like evidence of that yeah. before I send a person to prison for the rest of their lives when there's a chance they could be innocent. You've said it before. I'd rather, you know, let a hundred guilty men get away than send one innocent person to prison. And, you know, I've always kind of been like, well, I don't want to say a hundred guilty men, maybe like <laughs> you have. You always five. Like, yeah, too much on the conscience. But I, we both agree. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Was that present in this case? I don't think it takes a lawyer to say no. no. No, it wasn't. No. And the prosecution didn't do a great job. And we've had people like Brett from the prosecutor say right out, like they were going with this angle. Then that angle was gone and yet they still went with it. It was a very confusing uh, strategy that they implemented. And so I think we leave this series kind of with a question mark where there's anything is possible. I don't think Michael's a likable guy, um, but there is a world where he's a piece of shit, but he still didn't kill his wife. And and that may be what we're looking at here. But man, it's it's a it's a perplexing case. And I think that's why a lot of people are passionate about it. And I'm glad we covered it because this is a first where I usually lean one way or the other. And here I am kind of feeling the same way as I did when I came into it, which is what you don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know. Because we're also we have to keep in mind, we're going off the facts that were collected by 
investigators and uh, experts that we, we can't really trust, which we've established. And also, we're going off the testimony of Michael Peterson as far as what happened that night, how long they were outside. Did she? Michael Peterson's the one that told us she came in the house separately from him, right? Do we yes. have anything to confirm that? No, no. we don't. So no. for all we know, they came in the house together. So we're going off. We're trying. Or they weren't to, said, even out there to begin with. They were. They might have never yeah. stepped foot outside. There's no evidence yeah. that they were in the backyard, right? There's really. Yeah. There's only evidence of the front yard. So I've said it before, but you're building a house on a shitty foundation. The the evidence we have to analyze, a lot of it is been tainted. Supposition. Yeah, it's it's been tainted by the people who are interpreting it. Um, there's mm-hmm. questions about the autopsy, and then. The only person present during this was Michael Peterson, who is in question as far as uh, possibly killing her. So he would have an incentive to kind of manipulate the story and tell us things different. I, there was one other thing I didn't mention. It's all coming back to me. But I also think that the deleting of, of certain documents on his computer, that's that's not good either. But it could also be that he felt like they were going to pin it on him. So he was just trying to get rid of it because he didn't want it to make him look bad. So I, that's another way you, you can go either way with it. Yeah, I definitely feel like if if I was in that position, there'd be shit on my phones and computers I'd want to erase, you know, before the police got them. Yeah, you're like smashing them on the ground immediately. Yeah, like Alec Baldwin, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Tom Brady. For you guys who know Tom Brady, they wanted his phone in the uh, inflated football trial and he, he that phone got smashed too. Um, any final words before we uh, wrap this one up? No, I don't have anything to say. I, w- I can't wait to hear everybody's comments, though, and like see where you all land at the end of this. Crime Weekly first, where we're kind of like, hmm, hands up. Who knows? Who knows? I want to hear your comments. want to hear what you think after hearing the owl theory after, you know, do you think it was an accident? Do you think this was a, a homicide? Or do you think this was an owl attack that ultimately led to uh, her death through a series of unfortunate circumstances if you don't weigh down below we won't know what you think so make sure you do that as always you can follow us on social media it's crime weekly pod on instagram and twitter and uh, that's really it we appreciate you joining us here for another episode of crime weekly we will be back next week with a new case everyone stay safe out there bye bye